Did you know that every single day, about 1,000 tons of plastic end up in the ocean? Hey everyone, welcome to the Aroxys channel. Today we're diving into plastic. It's a huge topic, and honestly it touches every single one of us. Plastic. What is it really? Feels like it's always been here, right? But actually, it hasn't. Back in 1855, a British inventor named Alexander Parks came up with something called celluloid, the very first plastic made from nitrocellulose. It was a game changer. People used it for all kinds of things, musical instruments, toys, everyday stuff. But here's the twist. That first plastic wasn't exactly safe. It was highly flammable and under heat, it could literally explode. So yeah. The story of plastic didn't start out as clean and perfect as we might think. Well, the first fully synthetic plastic was created by Leo Baikland in 1907. He called his invention Bakelite. Later, it would come to be known as the mother of plastics. Could he have imagined back then just how much the world would change because of his discovery? Plastic only entered mass production after World War II in the 1950s. Since then, it has played a crucial role in the development of modern technologies. It's used in everyday life, medicine, construction, transportation, packaging, and many other fields providing convenience, safety, and functionality. Thanks to plastic, deforestation has actually decreased, by the way, and everything has become cheaper and more advanced. From cars and supermarket products to furniture, computers, and even the phone you're watching this video on. Today, humanity produces about 400 million tons of plastic every year. But what happens to it afterward? Recycling? Not quite. Only about 9% of plastic is actually recycled. The other 91%, that's roughly 364 million tons to Daltas, is either burned, dumped in landfills, or ends up in the ocean. Deliberately or indirectly and in massive amounts. For example, until the 1990s, New York used to simply load garbage onto barges and dump it straight into the ocean without much concern. Rivers also carry a huge share of plastic waste into the oceans, mostly from countries in Africa and Asia. Around 1.15 to 2.41 million tons every year. And what are the consequences of all this dumping? In the Pacific Ocean, an enormous garbage patch has formed. It's literally called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Its size is about 1.6 million square kilometers, comparable to three Texases, or even the entire country of India. Ocean currents bring plastic there from all over the world, and the majority of it is made up of microplastics, tiny particles less than five millimeters across. Microplastics are a true scourge of modern times, they've spread everywhere, even into our own bodies entering through food, water, and even the air we breathe. Some studies even suggest the presence of microplastics in the human brain, though I should note that this data hasn't been fully confirmed yet. Still, the amount of plastic keeps growing, and so does the area of its presence. Just look around you, there's bound to be plastic nearby. At this pace, it feels like an ecological catastrophe is looming. A human life lasts on average about 72 to 73 years, at best around 100. And during all that time, the mountains of plastic just keep growing. The planet will never be the same again. We're killing nature. Or are we? Let's go back 400 million years when the first trees appeared. But there were still no organisms capable of breaking down leaves, bark, or wood, which are made mainly of cellulose and lignin, natural polymers. For tens of millions of years, massive accumulations of organic matter took place. From the perspective of a human lifetime, it might seem like an eternity. Just imagine what a problem that would have been if we had lived back then. And it wasn't just 8 million tons a year like plastic. Imagine the enormous biomass they created. Part of it ended up in swamps or lowlands, then underground and was transformed into oil, coal, and gas. This period in history is called the Carboniferous. In essence, plastic, oil, and coal are the very same trees and other organic matter, from dinosaurs to algae. For the first time, nature found a solution thanks to special organisms from the kingdom of fungi, white rot. It was one of the first on Earth to learn how to break down lignin, which remained non-degradable for the longest time. 
Today, many organisms can do this, but it wasn't always the case. But let's think about this. Plastic and wood are made up of the same elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Roughly speaking, both wood and plastic are polymers. One created by nature, the other by humans from natural materials. So the real question is not about composition, but about the ecosystem's ability to process the raw material. Plastic appeared only 170 years ago. Yet in that time, organisms capable of breaking down this type of polymer have already emerged on our planet. Attention. The first time nature needed millions of years to start decomposing natural polymers, but now it has taken less than two centuries for plastic. Just think about that. Today, organisms that can process plastic are appearing all over the planet, and they belong to different kingdoms. Animals, fungi, and bacteria. Among bacteria, the most well-known is Ideonella sakiensis, which can break down polyethylene terephthalate, PET. There are also reports of mealworm larvae successfully consuming polystyrene, and marine fungi in Hawaii have been shown to decompose polyurethane. Considering that we have not yet discovered all species of organisms on Earth, the picture may be much broader than we imagine. In just two human lifetimes, nature has already found a solution. How quickly these organisms will spread, I don't know. But I am 100% sure that plastic will become a food base for them. In other words, all plastic will rot just like grass or wood. That's how it is. The golden age of plastic is coming to an end. Everywhere plastic isn't protected, it will break down and become unsuitable for use. This means wires, internet cables, bottles, and much more will start rotting. And not necessarily at the same pace as other organic matter, maybe even faster. Just imagine how the world might change again. As for the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I can assume that soon scientists will discover microorganisms that have already learned to break down microplastic. First, colonies of such organisms will grow, then they will shrink, maintaining an optimal amount to process the incoming plastic. In other words, plastic will become part of the food chain. For those especially worried environmental activists out there, let me say, genetic engineering is already capable of solving the plastic problem. For example, fungi could be created to process plastic in landfills, or plankton could be modified to do the same in the ocean. This will happen anyway. Science can simply speed up the process. By the way, we'll soon be launching a project where we'll be able to create various GMO organisms, including for such tasks, as well as new crop varieties for agriculture or animals with specified traits. Contact info for those interested is in the description. And what about plastic in the human body? For now, there is a global ban on the use of genetic engineering in relation to humans. An interesting fact. Humans actually have enzymes that can break down chitin, linked to our ability to eat insects. We inherited this from our distant ancestors, but right now we don't have enzymes that can process plastic and there's a ban on adding them into our genome. What could we do? We could give this ability to the beneficial bacteria living in our gut, for example to those that already process fiber. In other words, one day you might drink a yogurt from a glass bottle containing such bacteria so they would settle in your intestines and start breaking down the microplastic that comes in with food and water. That way the problem would be partially solved. To conclude, I want to say that things aren't as black and white as the media or eco-activists often make them seem. The world is changing, and sometimes it changes quickly. The main thing is to adapt in time. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. This was Aroxis. See you in the next episode.